Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'm out of the West Shore Sportsman's Association. It is a beautiful late February day, which means everybody is down here at the range. So you may hear a good bit of gunfire. But I've, I've come out here with my Colt Model 1878 double action revolver. Now, this was Colt's first truly big bore double action. This gun was chambered in all the same calibers as the single action army. Uh, some of the parts interchanged with the single action army, the, the barrel, the ejector particularly. But this gun was not really made for the civilian market. It was made for the military market and not the American military market. Uh, this gun was targeted at the British military market because the Brits really liked their double action revolvers and they had some very good ones. And Colt was really interested in cracking that market. And uh, his previous double action, the the 1877 was too small a frame. It was not a military handgun. It's definitely a civilian handgun. So they developed this, which is definitely a military handgun. Uh, and it's a beast. But let's go take a look at it. I'll give you some history. We'll shoot it, see how it does. Well, the 1878 is a double action revolver. And it will shoot in both single action and double action mode. So I'm going to shoot it in single action first to see where it's hitting. First time I've ever shot it. All right, let's take a look at how the 1878 did. Uh, first of all, in single action mode, it popped every primer, and it didn't shoot too badly. I was shooting at that uh, that orange dot with the spot on it uh, at the top of the nine ring. I was using that as my point of aim, and uh, the black dots uh, are covering the holes from my single action shooting. And so I shot about six inches high, and really, it didn't shoot too badly. I mean, I've got one flyer out there, but it's a fairly decent group considering what it is. It's got a heavy single-action trigger pull, but not awful. Now, the red dots represent my double-action shooting, and for that, because I knew that it was shooting high, I aimed at the bottom of the 10 ring. And really, I didn't put them that high from there. I only put them a couple of inches high in double-action mode. Uh, as you can see, I got much more of a spread, and the double action trigger pull is awful. I, I haven't measured it because it goes off of the charts of my scale, so there's, there's just no point. Uh, <clears throat> but the other issue with double action is I get at least one failure to fire out of each cylinder, and that's with the tension screw torqued down pretty tight on the mainspring to make it as strong as it can be. And this was a knock against these guns in the 19th century, and it absolutely seems to be true. So you've got a combination of a truly horrendous double-action trigger pull uh, and the knowledge that it might not go off when you pull the trigger, which is not a good feeling if you're using it to save your life. In 1877, Colt launched their first double-action revolver. 
uh, which is generally called the 1877, though at the time it had a much longer, a much longer name. And it is this beautiful little gun, uh, which was available in 41 Colt, 38 Colt, and 32 Colt. And it was colloquially known as the Thunderer in 41 Colt, the Lightning in 38 Colt, and the Rainmaker in the very rare 32 Colt uh, chambering. There are only about 200 of those made. <clears throat> By far, um, the majority of the over 166,000 of these little guys who were produced were made in either 41 Colt or 38 Colt. Uh, and you know, as I said, at 166,000 of these guns made, it was a very successful gun. So, a year later, Colt followed up with their second double action revolver, the Model 1878. And this gun was not nearly so popular for, for a variety of reasons that I'm going to get into uh, during this discussion. Uh, there were only about 66,000, uh, I'm sorry, only about 51,000 of these guns made. I'll give you the exact number later on. Um, so, you know, it was less than a third of the sales of its predecessor. But while the, the 1877 Colt was specifically targeted towards a civilian self-defense market, the 1878 Colt had military aspirations. Uh, the problem that Colt was facing, in Europe particularly, where double actions were very popular, was that they didn't have anything that could compete with the Continental or British double action military revolvers of the, of the era. Uh, the Colt Lightning, or Thunderer, was too light a gun uh, they had already decided, the, the British military had already decided, that 38 calibers were too light. They had used quite a few Colt 1851 navies during the cap and ball era, and they found that they didn't have the stopping power uh, for their colonial opponents. So they went to the 450 Adams cartridge and even higher, uh, because at the time, most officers purchased their own guns, private purchase, and they had 476 Ely, they'd have uh, 50 caliber uh, Tranters. I mean, there there's some pretty big guns out there. And they just didn't feel that the 36 caliber single action Colt had the stopping power. So certainly the 38 and 41 caliber 1877 was not interesting foreign militaries. Uh, that was a self-defense gun. It had it had some popularity in Europe. So Colt developed the 1878 specifically for the military market. And, and to be quite honest with you, they were specifically targeting the British military market. Uh, because the American military market, officers could buy their own guns. Um, but at the time, they were quite happy with the single-action Colt uh, Army revolver and the Smith and Wesson Schofield revolver, and there was no interest at that time, uh, the late 1870s, to purchase double action revolvers. The, the belief was that double action revolvers, in, in in the American ordnance community, were just wasteful of of ammunition. So, the coal company was specifically targeting the European market, and even more specifically targeting the British market. And, and in fact, they sent the first batch of these chambered for 450 Adams to Great Britain to try to drum up some interest in the British military. And even though there were some private purchases made, and there was even one emergency purchase made of, of this gun by the British military, uh, it did not get favorable reviews. There was not a whole lot of interest in it. So... Uh, ultimately, Colt did get some military sales, but they were quite low. This ended up being mostly used in the civilian market. Now, the 1878 was another design by uh, William Mason, Colt's superintendent, and uh, by Charles Richards, 
the supervisory engineer at Colt. And, and they were a great design team. They, they made a lot of, of Colt's iconic guns uh, during this period. Now, they modeled this pretty closely on the 1877, but they were trying to correct some of the 1877's defects. And among those defects were a tendency to break. Uh, and one of the parts that they had a real problem with on the 1877 was the locking bolt. Because on the 1877, the locking bolt... The locking bolt on the 1877 actually enters this way into the rear of the cylinder. Now, on most revolvers, the locking bolt goes up and down, and the slots cut the side of the cylinder. Well, Mason always thought that was a weak design because it, it thinned out the metal right over the cartridge case in the area that had the most pressure. So his idea with a locking bolt that went in from the rear was to not weaken the wall of the cylinder at all. You can hear my phone dinging with, with texts. So whenever you hear a ding, an angel is getting its wings. Anyhow, uh, they wanted to get rid of that, and, and William Mason decided that he really didn't need a locking bolt, that the gun could lock up based on the hand alone. And that's how they designed this. So it has really two, two features for locking. Uh, one is it will lock up strictly with the hand. And by the way, this gun is clear. I can see right through the cylinders, no, no heads. I check all of these before they come out here. We're not going to have an Alec Baldwin minute <laughs> here at Duelist Dead. Uh, so this gun locks up just from the hand pushing up against that cylinder. And there's a little spring down here that keeps back pressure against the ratchets. And of all things, the loading gate itself keeps things from, from backspinning. So if I put it on half cock, right, I can spin it to load, just like any single action gun. And it does not go backwards. And that's because of a little little piece down on the bottom of the hand. So, does this work? Yeah, it does. Uh, I honestly, I wouldn't have wanted to trust it, but it works quite well. Okay. We're gonna cut while I turn my phone off. Issues with this thing, I'll tell you right up front. It has a horrendous double action trigger pull. And, of course, there's a tensioning screw here in the butt. And if you loosen that enough to get a pull that you can live with, it's awful at popping primers. Even with it tensioned all the way down, uh, I was getting one primer and five that was not pop in double action. Single action, they all go off. But, of course, in double action, the hammer does not go back as far as in single action. You know, it goes back about two-thirds of the way. So it's not getting the full effect of the mainspring at, on double action uh, shooting. And they made the mainsprings heavy in these things because particularly 45 Colt uh, and particularly government 45 Colts had extremely hard primers. Uh, they had those internal primers to start with. Right, so it looked like a rimfire case. I mean, you had to dent the case with enough force to set the primer off in the center of the case. Uh, very tough, and and all of the military 45, 45 Colts, and later the 1882, uh, you know, 45 Army, which was a combination of the Schofield and the Colt round. They had very hard primers, and we're going to see what the Army stipulated to overcome this later on but but suffice it to say even though this has a horrific trigger pull it still doesn't hit the primers hard enough to set them off all the time so that's a real design problem with the 1878s
Well, the 1878 Colt was made in a very wide range of chamberings. Uh, basically, almost every chambering, though not quite, but every major chambering for the uh, single-action army revolver was duplicated in the uh, 1878. So it was chambered for 3220, 38 Colt, 3840, 41 Colt, 4440, 45 Colt, and that was all for the American market. For the British market, it was also chambered in 450 uh, Adams, also known as 450 Boxer, 455 Webley, 476 Ely, uh, and also 45 Colt, which they which they used over there. Uh, 45 Colt was by far the most common chambering for this gun. The 1878 also had a wide range of barrel lengths. Uh, they had short barrels, four inches and shorter. Those were custom options, but they were easy to get. And those guns were made without ejector rod housings. They're usually called sheriff's models. Uh, on the 1877s, they're usually called shopkeeper's models. I guess they figured too many shopkeepers weren't carrying around a boat anchor like the 1878. Uh, I don't think too many sheriffs were either, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the standard barrel lengths were four and three quarters, five and a half, and seven and a half. And five and a half inch barrels were by far the most common on this gun. Uh, and, and you'll turn those up all the time. Now my gun has a seven and a half inch barrel. And I'll be honest, when I was looking for one of these, I was looking for a five and a half inch. Uh, because I thought that would be the best balance of the bunch. But, just like with a single action army, this gun is surprisingly well balanced with a 7.5 inch barrel. And that's the barrel length that the Canadian um, military used when they bought this. So, uh, they didn't do bad. I, I actually have come to really enjoy the way this thing points. I just wish it wasn't such an uncomfortable beast to shoot, which, which we'll talk about later. So, you know, as I've said time and time again, this revolver was actually made for military use, but it got very little use by any military. The Canadians used it in the Boer War. And in America, the closest we came to military use was arming the Philippine Constabulary, with the 1902 variant of this gun, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And the gun that was used is an interesting variant of the 1878. Uh, it's the 1902, model 1902, which is an 1878 with one or two impressive differences. And visually, when you look at it, the first thing you notice is that it has a huge trigger guard on it. And a lot of modern collectors thought that that was because it was popular during the Alaskan and Yukon Gold Rush era. And that they enlarged the trigger guard so it would work with the bulky gloves and, and mittens that the prospectors were taking to the Arctic. Uh, as it turns out, that's completely untrue. Uh, but the story stuck, and, and a lot of people call it the Alaskan model for that reason. It's more properly called the Philippine model. And the reason the trigger guard is so big is because the army recognized the problem the Colt had with popping 45 Colt primers. Okay, now the reason they wanted 45 Colt is because they had been, the Army had been using double action revolvers chambered for 38 Long Colt uh, during the Philippine insurrection. And they found that they just couldn't stop those drugged up, fanatical Moro tribesmen with those 38s that it just didn't have enough enough power to put them down and that that was a real problem for them. And that experience is largely the reason why when the rest of the world went to 9mm semi-automatics for the 20th century, America remained the land of the 45 shooter. 
uh, with the 1911. Because the Army's taste for 38s was so soured by the Philippine insurrection that they, uh, they brought back the single action army to use during the insurrection and they contracted for the 1902 to use to keep the peace, both in 45 Colt. And when the time came to make a semi-auto pistol, they stipulated that it had to be 45 caliber and it had to be the power of the service cartridge at the time, which was the, the uh, M1882, uh, basically Schofield-powered cartridge. Right, same power. And, and that became the 45 ACP. So if you wonder why it's a 230 grain bullet and has the characteristics it has, it's because that matched the, uh, the power of the black powder cartridge in use in the Army at the time. Okay, so the government recognized that the 1878s had a problem busting caps and that that was a bad thing if you had bad guys charging you. You know, click, click, click. That was one here. So they stipulated an extra heavy mainspring be used in the 1878s that they were buying. Now the problem with that is I'm not a weak guy and I'll tell you what, it takes some work. <laughs> it takes some work to pull the trigger on the standard mainspring here. The extra heavy mainspring, that could not be shot in double action by anybody except Hercules. So what they did is they lengthened the trigger to put more leverage on the action so that you could actually cycle it. And in order to accommodate the longer trigger, they had to make that bigger trigger guard. And that's how we get the 1902 variant. Colt only made 51,000 of these uh, during the production run of 1878 to 1905. So even though that's not like a, a shameful number for a, a big double action of the period, it's really nothing to write home about. I mean, Smith & Wesson, when they produced their 44 caliber double action revolver a few years later, uh, they sold over 66,000 of these in almost the same period that Colt sold 55,000 of their big double action. So that's, that's like a 20% increase on what the Colt did. And, and the reason for that is because the Smith & Wesson is an altogether better gun. Well, let's see if we can ring a little steel with the Colt 1878. Maybe not. Maybe. Okay, well, that got the job done. <laughs> so what are my final impressions of the 1878 Colt as a shooter? Well, I've got to tell you, this gun is a little bit hard to love. Uh, I would rather carry a single action army than carry this guy any day. And among 19th century double actions, it is not my favorite by a long shot. Uh, it's got a heavy trigger pull, both single and double action. The double action pull is really abysmal. It's fairly accurate for what it is, uh, but very uncomfortable to shoot. That, that grip just recoils straight back into the web of your hand. You really feel it. So on the whole, there are better 19th century weapons designs than this guy. But did I have fun? You bet I did. <laughs> well, I hope you liked today's video. I actually I enjoyed shooting the 1878 Colt. It's, it's not easy to love, but uh, boy, it's a piece of history. And I just love shooting history. 
So if you enjoyed it, give it a big thumbs up. Helps us with the algorithm, as you well know. And if you're not a subscriber, well, I hope that you'll subscribe to the channel. And um, I'll see you again next week. Bye.